Great, Mike. Thanks very much. Um, so I am going to be moderating today's panel and uh, sorry, just get this. Interesting. And so first I'll very briefly introduce our illustrious uh, panelists and then give you a very quick overview of the uh, case that we're going to be discussing today, which is the case uh, known as the Myriad Genetics case more formally. So to my left, uh, we have Chris Hansen from the American Civil Liberties Union, who represented petitioners uh, at the Supreme Court argument today. Uh, to his left, uh, Joshua Sarnoff, who is a professor at DePaul University School of Law in Chicago. To his left, we have Artie Rye, who is a professor of law at Duke Law School and also recently served as the administrator for external affairs at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, next, we have David Foreman from the uh, Finnegan Henderson Law Firm, who uh, was involved in a couple of amicus briefs that were filed in the case, the one for target discovery and for the American Intellectual Property Law Association. And at the far end of the table, I'd like to introduce Greg Dolan, who is a law professor at the University of Baltimore Law School and the director of the Center for Medicine and Law at Johns Hopkins University and Baltimore Schools of Law. So our panelists uh, will each give their perspectives on the arguments, on the case. Um, but first, let me give you a very brief introduction and background uh, to sort of uh, set the framework for what we'll be talking about. The case is essentially about Section 101 of the Patent Act and what constitutes eligible subject matter for patenting. And the very broad question before the court on which they granted cert was whether human genes are patentable when they're isolated and purified. So the case resolves around mutations in two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. These mutations are strong indicators of elevated risk for breast and ovarian cancer. If a woman has one of these uh, mutations, or one of a series of mutations in these genes, her chances of developing one of these deadly cancers are significantly elevated. So it's been known for many years that there's a genetic basis for this heightened risk. There are certain populations that exhibited uh, this risk for uh, many decades. It was known there was a genetic basis. And in the, 19, the early 90s, there was a race to identify specific genes that would give rise to this risk. Um, there were many labs that were involved in this race. To make a long story short, Myriad Genetics, which was a company uh, that uh, was associated with the University of Utah's uh, very well-known Department of Genetics, won the race, um, sequenced the, uh, the DNA for BRCA1 and BRCA2 first, and obtained patents um, at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. In the following years, Myriad developed and offered a diagnostic test to women uh, to uh, determine whether or not they had the mutations that would lead to this elevated risk. Um, under the strength of this patent, others, uh, other labs in the United States were not able to perform the test. There have been many objections in the popular press and a debate about myriad genetics business practices in this area, um, but those, those questions are not really the ones that were before the court today. Before the court, we had the question of whether these DNA sequences of these genes, when isolated and purified in the way that Myriad did it, were subject, uh, eligible subject matter for patent protection. So the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on Section 101 patent eligibility goes back for more than a century. The cases are somewhat unclear, to say the least, at least in my view, and there is a cottage industry that's developed of academic papers and symposia that address this subject. Um, in this particular case, though, the Association of Molecular Pathologists and several other plaintiffs with the support of the ACLU challenged, I believe it was 15 claims of seven different myriad patents. They included both composition of matter claims, as claims on the actual chemical substance of the DNA, as well as a number of diagnostic methods and other method claims. The case was brought in New York, and Judge Sweet in the Southern District of New York uh, held that all 15 of those claims were invalid on various grounds, including uh, that they covered unpatentable subject matter as a result of covering natural laws, products of nature, and mental processes. The case was appealed to the Federal Circuit, who affirmed the invalidity of a number of those claims, and particularly the ones on diagnostic methods, um, especially in view of the Supreme Court's decision in Mayo and Prometheus. But 
reversed and upheld patents on the composition of matter claims. Those are the claims to the isolated and purified DNA sequences themselves. So the Supreme Court granted certiorari to answer a single question, and that question is, are human genes patentable? So with that, I'd like to invite Artie Rye, who was at the argument today, to, uh, to give us a little bit of background about the court's recent patent jurisprudence. The court seems to be very interested in patents these days. And to let us know you, your sense for what the temperature of the court was at the arguments in the sense of the questions they were asking and where they seem to be going. Sure. Uh, oh, thank you, Josh. <laughs> So thanks, George, for that excellent introduction to the area. So the the general um, interest in uh, Section 101 by the Supreme Court has uh, dates back at least, I would say, um, to the LabCorp versus Metabolite case, which the court ultimately did not decide, but I think that that case signaled um, the interest of at least Justice Breyer and a few others in the question of Section 101. As many of you probably know, prior to the Supreme Court's recent interest, there was a general sense that 101 was not a hugely significant bar to patentability. So the eligibility criterion of 101 was a relatively low threshold test under the Federal Circuit's view of the question. The first uh, decision in this case, uh, or the first Section 101 decision, was in the Bilski versus Kappos case, which was a different context. It was not the biomedical context, but rather a context involving a business method. And so the the issues um, were not necessarily squarely relevant to what was argued today. But nonetheless, the the court did. Th- think about these questions, these Section 101 questions for the first time, really since Diamond versus Deere, although some might argue that the JEM case involved thinking about these questions as well, but I think really in, 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 in full breadth, uh, in the full breadth of the uh, discussion didn't take place till Bilski versus Kapos. Unfortunately for many of us, I think it's fair to say that Bilski versus Kapos was a decision that left more undecided than it really left uh, decided, and and as a consequence, uh, the only thing that came out was that there seems to be some level of abstraction that patents can reach, at which point they're not eligible to be subject matter. But um, what that level of abstraction is is unclear. Uh, Subsequent to that, just last year, in a case directly relevant to the biomedical arena, the um, court heard an argument regarding a uh, so-called law of nature patent, or at least the court deemed it a law of nature patent. It was a patent involving essentially a method for updating the administration of drug based upon the metabolite level of the drug that was determined um, usually by a physician. Uh, The court in that case uh, unanimously decided, 9-zip, that um, this represented a law of nature and at least some of the the discussion by Justice Breyer of laws of nature suggested that the court took a very sweeping view of what might be considered a law of nature that was unpatentable. So um, the the run-up to the Merritt case, therefore, has been um, – th- there's been a lot of excitement, um, uh, and excitement not necessarily in terms of uh, 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 being optimistic about the case, but, but uh, thinking that the court might – might rule broadly in this case as well. And so one thing I found interesting immediately with respect to the oral argument today was the extent to which the court, uh, first of all, didn't really seem to uh, pound Prometheus very much. In fact, in in most of the questions they asked, they were really um, curious as to uh, how whatever they decided might impact process patents. They seem to think that it was very important that process patents continue to issue. And to, so to the extent that Myriad, uh, excuse me, Prometheus is a case where uh, process patents were um, dealt quite a blow, 
it was almost as if they were walking back Prometheus a little bit, in my estimation at least. More generally, it was interesting to me how quickly uh, at least uh, a few of the justices, and particularly Justice Kagan, got to the economic question. So she immediately got to the question of, well, if we strike down um, these particular composition of matter, matter patents, what incentive would companies have to to identify genes, essentially. Um, that was uh, one of the initial questions out of the box from her. And she wasn't particularly satisfied, um, I think, by the um, the response that in this particular case there was a lot of taxpayer funding involved and the like. Um, she was looking for a more general response that had to do with what would happen to private sector companies. And that was a theme. The economic theme was, I think, um, a source of unease um, interestingly, for a fair number of justices, in my estimation, um, more than I would have thought given the very sweeping ruling in the Prometheus case where the, economics, um, uh, the economic arguments made by industry didn't seem to sway the justices nearly as much. In this case, at least a few of the justices were quite concerned about the economic questions. And um, in addition to Justice Kagan, we had Justice Alito asking whether the case had to be just decided very broadly on the Section 101 grounds um, or whether, in fact, there might be other bases for striking down the patents. Um, Justice Roberts also sounded that theme, which would, of course, raise the issue of why they granted uh, the 101 question in the first place if they thought that these patents are more appropriately disposed of on other grounds. Um, but that's another issue. Um, another theme that I thought was quite interesting in the case, it came up a little bit later, but um, it certainly was a very prominent theme in the questioning uh, towards the end, was the, the justice's desire um, and interest in learning much more about the uh, so-called genomic DNA versus cDNA distinction. This is the distinction that the government has drawn in its brief, and the justices, I think, were quite um, uh, interested in that distinction. Even before John Verrilli, the Solicitor General, came up and discussed it, um, Justice Breyer and Justice Sotomayor raised it and asked about it, and also asked at great length about a brief by Dr. Eric Lander, which was just an amicus brief filed in the case, but it was the brief that was mentioned most by far in the discussion. Eric Lander clearly was the star of the argument, um, and to the point where they were asking uh, Greg Christianius about specific arguments that Eric Lander had made in his brief, and Christianius, I think, misunderstood and mixed up that brief with another brief because he started talking about pseudogenes, which was not a subject of, of the Lander brief and that I think probably is, it was not um, the best um, place for him to go. Um, in any event, so um, I think that distinction is going to um, be something that the court is going to be really interested in exploring further, perhaps as a way of addressing the Section 101 issue without um, throwing the industry into chaos, as the industry argues it will be thrown into chaos if all DNA is rendered unpatentable. Um, the other piece, as I suggested, that I find quite interesting is their emphasis on process patents and use patents, um, again, suggesting that maybe they intend to walk back mail a little bit or at least um, perhaps um, suggest that process patents can be quite important, um, at, at least in dicta. Obviously, that's not the process patent question is not an issue squarely in the case. The uh, one one sort of stepping back at a 10,000 foot level and thinking about the question um, from a standpoint, I like to think about a lot of these questions, the institutional standpoint, the thing that struck me was how complicated this case really is. It involves economics, it involves science, it involves interpretation of precedent. Well, the Supreme Court is pretty good at interpretation of precedent. That's what it does for a living. Whether it's particularly good at the science or the economics, I'm much more concerned about. And certainly, um, I think that there was places in the arguments and the questions where the justices caused me to be a little bit queasy when they asked certain scientific questions that seem completely um, 
to, to misunderstand and misapprehend the relevant issues. On the other hand, there were a couple of justices, I think particularly Justices Breyer and Sotomayor, who clearly had dug deep into the issue. Um, and again, there were some of the justices who were particularly interested in the cDNA versus gDNA distinction. Um, so I think there's some possibility that we will get a relatively narrow ruling out of this case, a ruling that draws fine distinctions between cDNA and gDNA, um, at least that's possible, and a, a ruling that would apply only to this case, essentially, um, and not uh, sweep more broadly. That said, I think that, you know, there remains the concern, and I think it's a valid concern on the part of some in the biotech industry that there might be language in a decision that gets to the issue of therapeutic proteins, which is really where I think the biotech industry is most concerned. I think it's less concerned about gDNA than it is about therapeutic proteins in particular. And if there's loose language about things purified from nature not being patentable, well, uh, I, I think that could be an issue. And there was some discussion of, you know, how much human intervention for purposes of purification, for example, has to be done. So we had both uh, Justice Kagan and Justice Alito talking about that issue at some length. Um, but I don't know that they really reached much closure on that question. And that's where I think they're really struggling. And if they are to re go broadly into issues of how much needs to be done to uh, a product of nature to make it patent eligible, I suspect that there may not be as much foundation for making clean distinctions in that um, respect as there is between making just a simple, very narrow distinction between cDNA and gDNA. So um, th those are my initial thoughts, and, and I would be curious to hear what my co-panelists have to say. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, can I add one, one point? Okay, um, go ahead. Uh, so um, one point that I thought was interesting, um, and this is maybe I thought it was interesting because I was at the PTO um, for uh, a while, including when some of these uh, discussions were taking place regarding the government position. There wasn't as much pushback, um, although there was some, but not nearly as much interest on the part of the justices I thought there might be on the uh, the fact that this was a reversal of a PTO position. Um, I think um, Greg Castanius emphasized that a lot, but the justices just weren't picking up on that. In fact, at one point, Justice Kagan said, well, let's forget about the deference issue. Let's go to, <laughs> let's go to, you know, at that point she was, I think, interested in plants being pulled from the Amazon, and she wanted to focus on that. Yeah, he, he clearly uh, tried to get them interested in skid more deference for the PTO uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, quite unsu so, um, so Ari, thanks, thanks so much for that. Um, so now, uh, Chris Hansen, uh, who is at my left, just uh, is just back from the Supreme Court, having argued for the petitioners in this case uh, in, a, in a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, performance. Um, and, and Chris, you know, we'd love to hear from you, um, you know, the perspective that you bring, why, why did you bring this case and how do you think it went today? Yeah, I, I uh, work at the ACLU um, and uh, we had for a while a, a full-time employee who's known as the ACLU science advisor and her job was to look for cutting edge issues of science that raise civil liberties issues. She came to me one day and she said, do you know there are patents on human genes? And I said, no, nah, no, nah, that can't be right. You mean there's a patent on how you take the gene out of the body? She said, no, there's a patent on human genes themselves. And I said, well, that's just plain wrong. Let's sue somebody. <laughs> so we did. Um, although when the, the interesting thing to me about that story, which is a true story, is that w at the time we had that discussion, I knew nothing about patent law and I knew nothing about genetics. But it seems so fundamentally obvious to me that there was something wrong here. Uh, in spite of that, we spent two years talking to people all over the country and reading as much as we possibly could on both genetics and patent law to see if the common sense reaction that everybody has when they hear that the patent office is granting patents on human genes was correct or false. And we ultimately concluded that the common sense reaction, of course that can't be right, was the correct reaction, it was the, is the legally correct reaction. And so we set out to bring a civil rights case challenging the patenting of human genes. 
99.9% of all patent cases are brought by company, big company A against big company B. And they're a fight really about money more than about anything else. We treated this as a civil rights case. We did exactly what we do in other civil rights cases. We went out and solicited clients that we thought would be sympathetic. We went looking for a context in which to raise the issue that we thought would be sympathetic. We ultimately decided to sue Myriad Genetics because Myriad Genetics has been a bad corporate citizen and because Myriad Genetics has the patents on two human genes that correlate with increased risk of breast or ovarian cancer. And it seemed to us that everybody would understand the dangers of patenting genes that correlate with an increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. We set out to recruit organizational plaintiffs. We ended up representing four national organizations of geneticists and pathologists. We also recruited some of the nation's leading geneticists, a couple of genetic counselors, two women's advocacy groups, and six individual women who, in fact, are at risk of breast or ovarian cancer. One of the most interesting things to me after we assembled that plaintiff group was the outrage, the shock and horror that greeted the idea that women had anything to do with the issues in the case. It was the consensus of the patent bar that that was the most frivolous thing that had ever been done in the history of patent law. And, indeed, there were calls for us to be disbarred for having brought such a frivolous case. It seemed obvious to us that if you're talking about two genes that cause an increased risk of breast or ovarian cancer, if Myriad Genetics has the only right to look at those genes, the only right to research those genes, the only right to test those genes, that women were deeply affected by it. And it seemed logical to us that women ought to be heard in the context of bringing a lawsuit to challenge the patentability of human genes. We also discovered that the law says that you can't patent products of nature or laws of nature. You can't patent gold. You can't patent E equals MC squared. You can't patent gravity. And that would be true even if you were Newton or Einstein or the first person who uncovered gold. It simply impedes the progress of science if you allow patenting on products of nature. It doesn't advance the progress of science. And so we constructed an argument that the patentability of human genes was improper under Section 101 under this product of nature, law of nature doctrine. We brought the case in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. As you heard, we also challenged a bunch of method claims, but I'm not going to talk about those. We can talk about them if you want at some point, but that wasn't what today was about. We won on the method claims. We brought the case in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York and won on every claim that we challenged. By the way, it is true there were seven patents, claims of which we challenged, but the seven patents probably had 70 or 100 or 200 claims, and we only challenged 15 of the claims. We went to the United States Court of Appeals. Myriad took the case to the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. All patent cases have to go to a specialized appellate court called the Federal Circuit, which I think it is fair to say has largely become the captive of industry. And the Federal Circuit ruled against us on a two-to-one vote, although what I've been saying is they actually voted against us on a 1.51 to 1.49 vote. We got one judge who thought we were clearly wrong. We got one judge who thought we were clearly right. And the third judge said, well, I think the plaintiffs are right, and if I were starting from scratch, I would rule for the plaintiffs. But we've been doing this a long time, so what the heck? Let's just let it keep going. She's the one I count as the 51-49. We took the case up to the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court granted, vacated, and remanded in light of Mayo v. Prometheus. The Federal Circuit repeated its same decision almost word for word with no suggestion that the Mayo decision had anything to do with their prior opinions. We petitioned for cert again, and cert was granted, and that's how we had argument today. You know, I agree with Artie that the case raises a lot of enormously interesting and profound questions, but I actually think the case is astonishingly simple. Myriad's argument all along has been that by extracting the gene from the body, they've invented something. If that doesn't just seem stupid to you right off the bat, I don't know what to say. And we've used examples like that would suggest that you could patent kidneys. 
uh, because when you extract a kidney from the body, Myriad would say that's an invention, and indeed this morning Myriad said that was an invention. Um, the the issue the genetics can get really complicated, and the and the patent law can get really complicated. Um, but fundamentally, this is an astonishingly simple case. Can you patent a piece of the human body? Can you give a private company the right to stop all research on a piece of the human body? Can you give a private company the right to stop all women from getting a second opinion on whether they have an increased risk of breast or ovarian cancer? Uh, the answer, it seems to us, is self-evidently no. Chris, no, thank, thank you very much. Um, actually, I'm going to use my moderator's partner, and I have a very quick question for you that many of us have, have wondered, which is why you chose the Southern District of New York to bring the initial district court case in. And, and my speculation is that uh, it's because the Park Davis case was uh, heard there in 1911, and Justice Learned Hand, uh -uh. Uh, and, and, and Justice Judge Sweet actually overruled Park Davis in the case. Is that not the reason? No, God knows. Okay, so that's the law professor's reason. What's the real reason? No, Park Davis went the wrong way. Yeah, well, exactly, he wanted it overruled, which we, it was. No, God, you don't go into a court hoping to get something overruled. You go into a court hoping to get something to win something. No, uh, it, it, it was far less uh, interesting a story than that. Far less interesting story. We rule out a couple of jurisdictions, uh, San Francisco and Boston and so on, because they, the courts there are so heavily influenced by the industries, the, the biotech industry and the computer industry. Uh, we wanted a court that was relatively sophisticated, like the judges in the Southern District of New York are. And frankly, we wanted to be able to walk to court instead of drive or uh, fly. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't believe that that's one of the reasons, but that's one of the reasons. Okay. Okay. I still want to write an article about the attempt to overturn the 1911 case. But in any case. <laughs> Which was wrong. The 1911 case was wrong, by the way. No, fair, fair enough. Anyway, okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. So, so now I'd actually like to turn to David Foreman um, down at this end, who uh, participated in the brace for two of the Amici, in this case, Target Discovery and the American Intellectual Property Law Association. Um, and David, why, why is the AIPLA interested in this case? The reason that every the AIPLA, that every patent bar in the entire biotechnology industry and much of the chemical and pharmaceutical industry came in on this case is because uh, the plaintiffs are, are de demanding a, uh, a, change in, a, massive, a, a change in the patent law that would very seriously hurt them. Uh, and that they feel is uh, wrong for many reasons, starting even with that question presented, are human genes patentable? Well, the, uh, we're not talking about patents on genes. We're talking about patents on isolated DNA molecules, which are artificial molecules made by man, never existed in nature, and they're basically they're chemical reagents. And uh, so there was uh, a, a lot of concern also because... As this case moved up, uh, we got to the Supreme Court with a very poorly developed factual record, very controversial factual decisions that are thrown back and forth with no uh, uh, lower court decision on the, the facts, really. And um, there was a great concern that I think was justified because today at oral argument, the justices did exhibit a fair amount of um, lack of knowledge or uh, I mean, thirst for understanding, but lack of knowledge of both the science and of patent law in general. And uh, <clears throat> I guess another thing that concerns people is that uh, I mean, there's that truism, bad cases make bad law. This was a, a terrible case in which to analyze uh, th this issue because the myriad patents, very old, very broad patents, are, are patents that won't be repeated. That, uh, I mean, a lot of the complaints have to do with the great breadth of the claims that they allegedly tie up uh, the entire research on BRCA genes, something they don't actually do. There have been thousands, 10,000 papers published on the BRCA gene by people who are not, mostly not at myriad. But anyhow, there was... <coughs> 
this is a sort of patent that just will not be issued anymore. There are a tremendous amount of prior art from the Human Genome Project. There's a great narrowing of what you can patent of these type of molecules from the PTO utility guidelines. The myriad claims aren't being challenged. They're being challenged as to whether they're eligible for patents, but not whether they, in fact, are valid patents. And there's no question that the broadest claims are invalid. So what the industry sees is the possibility that the Supreme Court is going to make a very serious radical effect on the way that they can get patent protection to get incentives for development of their products based on a problem that's disappearing or certainly a situation that has radically changed. Another issue I'd just like to mention, I mean, I'll just talk about a few things that are interesting. One is the intervention of the U.S. government. That is, there's a the government often intervenes as an amicus in Supreme Court cases. They're extremely influential when they do the justices. And this government brief, the government intervention was very strange. They basically completely repudiate 40 years of patent office, very careful practice trying to get it right on the patenting of these molecules. And it's kind of mysterious why the patent office is not represented. Another reason why the patent bar really had to come in. And it's also unusual because the solicitor's briefs are usually wonderful. This brief is full of errors of law. It's full of scientific errors. The first briefs that went to the Federal Circuit were so bad that they were actually ridiculed in part by the Federal Circuit judges because they had some of it because of the way they were constructed. And, I mean, there is, there are Supreme Court cases that they shouldn't give deference to a government agency. When the, what it basically is, is appellate counsel's post hoc rationalizations. This, the government position, we're not sure why. I mean, there's been no, it's a very important position they've taken. And we don't really know what motivated why this position was taken, particularly to completely repudiate the patent office position. And one of the main problems with the government brief is they say certain DNA, the so-called cDNA, are patentable. But these other DNA or pieces of DNA or little tiny pieces of DNA are not patentable because they allegedly are products of nature. But they really pushed a, I guess for intellectual purity or intellectual consistency, a very strong, every molecule that exists in nature cannot be patented. And that doesn't merely go against 40 years of patent office practice. It goes against 100 years of patent office practice. That for many, many years, it's been possible to isolate, if you isolate a wonderful molecule from a source in nature, perhaps an antibiotic or a hormone or a new antibody, then you could get a patent for the isolated or purified material because it really is a contribution. And, you know, one may ask, I mean, why, how can you do this? You know, this nature made this, not man. And I think the real reason is, indeed, it's a requirement in Section 101 that to get a patent, what you have has to be novel. And why do we say it has to be novel? Is it because we Americans like to have sort of horse races? You know, the winner of the competition gets there first, gets the prize. Not really. The whole, the main rationale for requiring novelty is once something is in the public domain, once the public has access, 
to the invention, you can't take it away from the public at that point. And then, so it's only things that are introduced to the public that the public didn't have access before. Only those kinds of things are eligible for patents. And this is actually, I mean, this is, if you look at the rationale, it all actually works for patents on machines and chemicals that are entirely synthesized in the lab. But it also works really for these isolated products like vitamin B or prostaglandin, or if they actually are products of nature, these pieces of DNA, which is that the public had no access to them whatsoever. I mean, the prostaglandins example I like, very, very important compounds in the body, presence in incredibly tiny amounts such that you couldn't do anything with them until Bergstrom, who also got a Nobel Prize, made them, got a patent, made them available as a purified compound that could be studied and has since been used as a drug and the source of other drug research. So there's great fear in the industry that, I mean, I hope that Artie Rye is right, that the Supreme Court will craft a very limited decision. But if they abide this, if they create a whole new, and it would be new, product of nature doctrine, then all sorts of industries, the drug industries, the industry that makes biofuels, many, many different industries would be stymied because they couldn't get a patent on their compound. And that also relates to another issue that came up in oral argument, which was the justices seem to be really inviting, almost begging the presenters to somehow say, well, it doesn't matter if we can't patent a product of nature because you could get a process of use patent. And, I mean, they were just, they sort of got that. They were fishing for that. And the patent bar would feel that's a terrible idea because it's well known that the process of use patents are not as strong. I mean, I could go into a lot of technical details as to why they're not as strong. They're much harder to get in the patent office. You could discover a wonderful new drug that cures many kinds of cancer and then get a patent only for using it for curing leukemia. And somebody else could run in and say, well, we're going to use it for lung cancer and sell it everywhere. And where it would be used off-label for every kind of cancer and it would basically take away most of the economic benefit of this discovery. So they're harder to get. And then finally, the main use of the actual patented molecules that are at issue in this case, their main use, the main use of at least the primers and probes, the various pieces of DNA, are for diagnostic methods. And in the Prometheus case, the Supreme Court basically killed diagnostic method patents. So on the one hand, they're saying you could get a method patent, but not certainly the method for using these molecules. Okay, great. No, thank you. I wonder if I could just go out of order and just ask Artie if you're comfortable to respond to one thing that David has mentioned. Why is it that the PTO remains so silent? If you can tell us anything about that in this, or if not, then we can move on. So I can't say anything about, what I can say is based upon general principles of administrative law. So let me say that because I'm an administrative law professor as well. I think it would be very extraordinary for 
an executive branch agency to take a position contrary to that of another executive branch agency. There have been situations where independent agencies like the FTC have taken a position that's different from DOJ, for example. That happened with some of the reverse payment stuff, as you probably know. But from an administrative law perspective, I think it would be quite extraordinary for a core executive branch agency to say that they're taking a position different from that of the Department of Justice, because if you believe, in, as I do, in a unitary executive, although not in all the extreme forms that some of the people who believe in unitary executives have, have advanced the theory, um, you can't have two heads of the executive branch. So I, I think that that's a, a, a something that's accurate and also doesn't reveal any confidential information. Very <laughs> <laughs> adroitly done. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. I've looked for leaks. I've asked many people to top the patent office. Everybody's lips are sealed. Whatever. Uh, I'm very curious as to what happened, and I have no idea. Well, we'll have I, to wait till the yeah. time capsule is opened uh, 99 years from now. So, okay. Um, great. Well, thank you, David, very much. Um, so now, actually, I'd like to turn to uh, to a couple of our our, our other two panelists who who uh, submitted Amici briefs, and and Greg Dolan who's with us, uh, whose brief is for the Center for Medicine and Law at Johns Hopkins and uh, University of Baltimore. What, what, what is the perspective there of sort of the medical community? Well, uh, I suppose I'm loath to speak for medical community writ large because I think they are, much like everybody else on this panel, are of two minds. You know, there's um, the AMA, of which I used to be a member and an officer, uh, actually filed a brief on the opposite side. Um, which in some ways is not surprising. Right? AMA has been long opposed to patents on most anything medically related. Uh, they sort of viewed as an infringement on doctors' ability to properly treat a patient. Uh, I mean, so they recognize that, you know, you can't do completely without patents, but so they, for example, they oppose uh, patents on methods of treatment. They oppose patents on certain uh, surgical uh, equipments and devices back in the day. Uh, I mean, they have a history of um, being, for lack of a better term, anti-patent. Um, so, of course, there are medical communities, so I, but at least I take solace in the fact that Dr. Ananda Chakrabarty, uh, famous from the eponymous case of Diamond vs. Chakrabarty, ended up on the same side of the V as I did. So, uh, and he certainly is also part of a uh, medical or at least scientific community. Uh, and so uh, certainly there's no unified um, view by the community as to what sort of the law should be. Uh, that said, it seems to me that, you know, if we view patents as we have long viewed patents as a tool to promote innovation, we should ask ourselves um, what, you know, what would be accomplished by either having these patents on uh, DNA or not having these patents on DNA. And so Chris, in his argument this morning, um, said, which not incorrectly, I might add, that certainly there's lots of scientists who are uh, moved by simple pursuit of scientific truth or, you know, some perhaps by, uh, you know, a search for Nobel or other prizes or just general interest in, um, in uh figuring out, you know, what makes the world work. And that's, I think, again, I don't think that's incorrect. I think that's quite true. And I think, you know, we've survived as a, as a human race for thousands of years. Like patent protection, we invented the wheel, and we've invented, you know, penicillin that wasn't uh, patent, patented, and we've invented a whole bunch of other things. And so, from, but from my perspective, the question is not whether we will get there, because I think ultimately we will, even if we abolish the patent system completely, my question, from my perspective, is that faster and more is better. And so the patent system, in my view, incentivizes more people. And I think Chris, although he perhaps he didn't mean to, but I think he suggested, or at least um, unwittingly implied that that's the effect of the patent system in this morning's argument when he said that, you know, had Myriad not gotten there, other firms were essentially nipping at Myriad's heels, and they were almost... You know, they, they were almost first to discover it, so uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. And my response to it, some of them were certainly moved by the desire to win a Nobel Prize or a desire to sort of to get tenure at the university or whatever else, but some of them, just like Myriad, some of them were also moved by the profit motive. 
And so the fact that there were multiple peoples working on this project is a good thing because not only did the Marriott patents come of it, but there are sort of other avenues of research uh, I'm sure were opened and were pursued afterwards. So that was kind of, that was the, the view of uh, myself and, and the center that I run that, so when we filed the brief, that there are, that more is better, faster is better, and um, ultimately, if we are unhappy with the patent balance, the, the balance of the patent law has struck between innovation and so monopolization of certain markets. Um, it is ultimately up to Congress that can hold hearings, that can sort of determine where that balance should be restruck if it should. Um, my concern with this case, uh, and perhaps if Artie is right, then perhaps there's a concern that um, ultimately will prove to be overblown. But my concern is, given how the Supreme Court has written several recent patent cases, that will either write it over broadly, or in a very murky fashion, or worse yet, both. Right? So, um, even if, so even if they do end up writing a narrow opinion, to the extent that opinion will have to be poured and puzzled over by the lawyers, the federal circuit judges, the district court judges, and ultimately the people who uh, decide to invest money in research, that's not going to be a good result. And unfortunately, that's what Supreme Court in the last few patent cases have been known to do. I mean, think back to a case that ultimately had very little to do with patent law, right? It had to do with uh, basic principles of equity, right? So eBay versus market exchange, the injunction case, whether you get an automatic injunction once you're a judge to be an infringer. That was the rule of the federal circuit for many years. If you've infringed, you're automatically enjoined from doing so up front. So the Supreme Court takes the case, they rule 9-0, no, you don't get an automatic case. You apply general principles of equity. You balance the hardships, you know, the usual things that you've learned in your, uh, in, in, uh, in, in law school. But then, of course, there's two concurrent opinions, each attracting four justices, right? So there's Justice Thomas writing for a 9-0 majority. Then Chief Justice Roberts writes for four justice concurrence says, sure, you know, principles, general principles of equity are great, but really we should look at history. So kind of keep doing what, you're, what you've been doing for a long time, just pretend like you're checking all the boxes. And so that's really what you should be doing. And Justice Kennedy responds, he's like, no, no, absolutely, history is great, and we love history, but sometimes history doesn't really answer modern questions. So really don't do what you've been doing before, so but look at modern application of this rule. You know, I was on the, I would clerk on the Federal Circuit post eBay, and so when we were faced with those, you know, when we were faced with those questions, do we uphold injunctions, do we not? I looked around who was sitting together with my judge, right? Because the law as propounded by the Supreme Court told us absolutely nothing. Said, well, you know, do kind of either do what you've been doing or don't do what you've been doing or, you know, just mouth, you know, magic words and then you'll be fine. Um, and so if that's the type of opinion Supreme Court writes in this case, however it's going to come out for Chris's clients, ultimately I think so the, the, the broader implications on the bar and on the science and on the medicine, I think, are going to be, if not dire, then problematic. Great, great. Thanks very much. Um, and then Josh Sarnoff, <coughs> who uh, is uh, on my left, uh, submitted an amicus brief on behalf of uh, himself and a number of law professors. I was, by way of full disclosure, one of the law professors who signed Josh's uh, brief, but I will let you discuss what this uh, this group thought about the case. I'll get to it at the very end. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I want to say I thought Artie did a wonderful job of summarizing, I think, what the concerns of the justices were. And I'll add a few um, to that. But I wanted to pick up on some of the interesting discussion that you heard, because there are so many really odd things about this case. So for example, the government is a unitary executive. The government has come out with its position that isolated DNA patents are ineligible. But the patent office is taking a position until the case is over and is decided, we're going to follow what we always did. Similarly, the question about, you know, we've been doing this for 40, 30 years, however long you want to see, you know, go back to when they actually started issuing isolated DNA patents as opposed to isolated chemical patents. Um, 
you know, that was said, justices seem to provide no traction for that argument. They just seem not to care particularly that this was long precedent practice, in part because they have the difficult question. If the Federal Circuit and the Patent Office have not been following what we think is the law for 30 years and we're only getting around to it now, why should we give deference to these practices? Now, there is a very strong reliance interest of industry that's behind some of this, which I think they are concerned about, in particular they're concerned about it going forward, but they may not be so concerned about it if it only affects some people for the patents of the past. One other kind of thing in that genre is, you know, the reliance interest goes back to cases on isolated and purified chemicals, such as the yeast pasteur, uh, Louis Pasteur's yeast, uh, isolated yeast patent and the famous Park Davis case. Um, and after a case issued by the Supreme Court in 35 called Amer um, American Fruit Growers versus Brogdex, the head of the patent office says, in light of the Supreme Court decision, we probably wouldn't have issued those patents now. So you come back to the same problems. What do you do with longstanding practices that just may be wrong? That's point one. Um, point two, when we talk about the statute, there was a lot of discussion about new and useful, right? There's also these categories of things and whether these things meet the categories of things. And there have been previous cases saying, yeah, even though it meets the category of the thing in the statute, manufacture, etc., not everything that meets that category is patentable. So then the question is, is it new and is it useful? Except there's also some other language of the statute no one ever talks about. Whoever invents or discovers. This goes back to, I think, where Chris starts, which is, is this an invention? At least is this an invention or discovery within the meaning of the history of the Patent Act? That's part of the question, is there in fact a product of nature exception to the patent law so that certain things that are too much like a product of nature are not an invention, i.e. not a human invention, even if they include some human manipulation. So the Brogdex case, what did you have? Well, you had a treated fruit, which clearly involved human inter uh, intervention. You had that fruit acquiring new property, so it's new and useful. And the court didn't say in that case it's not an invention. They said it's not a manufacturer within the scope of the statute. You have the Funk Brothers case just before the 52 Act, which everyone agrees is the basis for the decision making. And in Funk Brothers, what you had was you had biological materials, cultures, that were not put together. And when put together, they had the property that had been discovered of non-mutual inhibition. So it is both new and useful to do this and put it together, and they claim the combination. Synthetic thing, and they say this is not an invention. Now, there's an argument, and this is where we get back to the brief. That was really just about obviousness law. It wasn't creative enough to do it. And therefore, when the court in 1952 separated the law and said, here's what can be patented under 101, and you also have to ask whether it's sufficiently creative under one, Section 103, the obviousness statute, we took care of this problem. Well, actually, it doesn't quite work that way because they still have the language in 101, whoever invents and discovers, and there's a history that relates to Section 100B about saying what is a process and what's considered a process so that there's a case that came out shortly after the 52 Act and said, look, it may be new, it may be useful, but because it's really so similar to the things that came before, then it is still not an eligible invention under Section 101, which incorporates the process language from Section 100B. Why is this all important? Well, it's all important because the court is really struggling desperately to try to find lines to justify the distinctions on the science of these different things. And it has to come up with some kind of a theory. Surprisingly enough, having issued this broad um, decision in Mayo versus Prometheus where they said, look, the government is arguing here, just rely on Section 103. And they said, no, Section 101 performs an incredibly important function. Let's start there. It's a gatekeeping role. And in this case, they asked the question, we don't like 101. Give us a reason why we should have to reach it for, to get to the broadest claims which were challenged. And General Verrilli, properly said, you just said this is really important and you should use 101 to invalidate these things. And what's more, that 
101 performs something that 103 doesn't. But he forgot to say what that was. That's where the brief comes in. And what 101 does is it treats the natural discovery as if it was prior art. And for considering whether you have a sufficient advance to treat it as an invention in the first place. Now, the tax people have figured this out. They just did it under a different part of the new statute. What they said is, if you have a tax liability method, we're going to treat that as if it's in the prior art. In Mayo v. Prometheus, the Supreme Court got it. They said there's nothing in Section 102 or 103 that will treat laws of nature, which was the issue there, or products of nature, which is the issue here. Actually, physical phenomena is the language they used, as if it was prior art. But the history does it. They keep repeating the language out of originally O'Reilly v. Morris, later picked up in the 78 case. Parker v. Fluck reiterated again in Bilski that you treat this stuff, even though newly discovered by the scientists, as if it was in the prior art. At that point, the question is, is there a sufficient transformation, or is there some kind of sufficient human creativity in what you've done with what you have taken, and what is now treated as prior art? And that's the 101 inquiry. So, where does all this lead? Who knows? I mean, I predicted wrongly that it would be an 8 to 1 decision in validating, sorry, in upholding the claims in Prometheus v. Mayo. And yet I'm going to go out on record in saying I think 9 to nothing that these claims are all going to be found invalid. Why do I say that? Well, again, Justice Kennedy, under our law, our law is a patent ever divisible so that it's valid in part, but invalid in another part. It can still stand as to that part. So here we go back to not only do they not understand the science and spend a lot of time asking about it. They understand. This is a basic aspect of patent law. First, they were trying to distinguish between, it wasn't clear whether they were talking on a claim-by-claim basis or the patent. But even within a patent, Chris correctly responded for the claim, right, if the claim applies to anything that is not subject matter, the claim is invalid. So even if Artie is right that they want to distinguish between what is a genomic DNA and a, you know, cDNA, and so long as you believe that these claims apply to genomic DNA, they have to go down. But then the question is why? What's the basis for making this distinction? And there they just seemed terribly unsympathetic to the idea that the creativity, alleged creativity involved in snipping and maybe chemically modifying the genomic DNA to get synthetic DNA of a particular sort, right, is a human invention with sufficient creativity. And yet they still haven't figured out the correct language to articulate that question. So all I can suggest is if they read our brief, they will have the language, they will have the theory, and then all they need to do is get the science right. And then we will have, whether it's a narrow decision, whether it's a broad decision, at least a clear decision. And I'll stop there. I just would like to add just one quick point. Not all of us happen to agree that the Funk Press was correctly decided, whether it's a matter of obviousness or Bill 101. So. I would like to say that if they would instead read our brief, they'd realize that the statute clearly says that compositions of matter are patentable subject to the conditions of this, of the Patent Act. And the right way to decide it is to take, consider everything patentable, even that kidney. It's patentable subject matter. It's a composition matter. And there's not a chance in the world that that would ever get a patent because it's either not novel, it's obvious, it's not useful. All these simple, simplistic hypos go away. Let me just respond very quickly to that. Two points. The first is, if that's right, then all of the decisions, with the exception of Diamond v. Deere and Diamond v. Chakrabarty, which upheld the patents for the last 50 or so years, are wrong. Okay? That just can't be right. The second and much more important point. Which cases? Every case where they, so let's take Bilski. Bilski is clearly a process, and it was clearly involved in human intervention. Patent eligible. Right? Prometheus. I don't know how they came out that way, but as I said, I predicted to go with the wrong way. But Prometheus involved administering synthetic drugs. And 
It clearly involved human interaction. Ineligible. That's what I'm saying. It can't be right. And even Justice Breyer said, anything made by man, we don't believe it. Well, I don't have the exact language quite right, but if you want me to look it up, I will. Anything under the sun. Thousands and thousands of cases decided by the lower courts and the appeals courts were right under my theory. Absolutely. And that goes back to the difficult question. When the lower courts are not following what the Supreme Court thinks is the law for many, many years, it creates a real problem. So I think that's exactly right. And the Supreme Court clearly is not going to hold that a kidney is patent eligible subject matter. They're just not going to hold it. And that's where I think Greg Castanis really did a bad job, I think, of not fully engaging where the court was. He may believe that a kidney should be patent eligible subject matter, but that's not where the court is. And so you have to come up with a test that will distinguish the kidney from the GDNA. And that's what I think he needed to do and didn't quite do in that particular case. I think there was a brief, the Lander brief, that distinguished the GDNA from the CDNA, but what he needed to do was distinguish the kidney from the GDNA, and he didn't do that. And I know that the patent bar would like to not distinguish the kidney. They would like to have the kidney thrown in, but that's not where the Supreme Court is. And, you know, that I think is a failure of argumentation on the part of the patent bar. It could have distinguished the kidney from the GDNA. It would have been a tricky thing to do, but it could have done it. And I think failing to do that is a real problem. Well, the distinction with the kidney is simply that maybe a kidney is patentable, but there's lots of prior art, because since, you know, the 1600s. No, but I think it's harder than that. They have to distinguish it as not patent eligible in the first instance. And, you know, Greg tried to distinguish it by saying, oh, there's prior art, it's obvious, blah, blah, blah. Breyer is not going to buy that. Breyer wants something that will say a kidney can't be patent eligible. And I think most of the justices on the court also want that. I mean, it was clear from Justice Kagan's hypothetical about the chromosome that she was uneasy about the idea that a chromosome would be patent eligible subject matter, no matter how obvious it might be and so forth, that that's a different set of inquiries. And so it seems to me that the thing that the patent bar failed to do in this case and I think could have done was try to come up with a distinguishing line between kidneys and chromosomes and GDNA. And I think there is a line to be drawn. I may or may not agree with it, but there is a line to be drawn, and they didn't do it. I just want to add two things. First, I want to compliment Greg Castanhas. I don't think it actually advanced his argument and that it actually lost the court, as already said. But he believed it, and it's a consistent and coherent position. And I admire counsel who stick to their consistent and coherent position, and he should be complimented for that. That said, it just emphasizes again what he was trying to say is, no, no, we'll handle this under the 103 issue. And the whole point is exactly the one I tried to make. If you go back in time when there wasn't prior art, first person to discover that the kidney is in the body, you then get the kidney by isolating it. There's no prior art unless the product of nature doctrine under 101 says it's not, that is treated as prior art, and isolating is just not enough to make it a human intervention. So I think the distinction he could have made was that we as human beings have enjoyed the benefits of kidneys from time immemorial, whereas we haven't enjoyed the benefits of knowing what the GDNA sequence was since time immemorial until BRCA sequenced that gene. We didn't know about it. Whereas, and that I think is a pretty easily graspable distinction. Well, I don't know, I mean, but the gene itself does many things, right, that we do enjoy. We don't know all the things that BRCA1 and 2 do. We know that these mutations, you know, give an elevated, but there are probably hundreds of other functions that genes have that we don't know, just like the kidney. I mean, we are benefiting from those today, aren't we? Well, I agree it's not a total bright line, but in general I think that the more you can say that the public was benefiting from this thing before somebody came along and patented it, the clearer line you can draw between what the GDNA patent represents and other stuff. Okay. So I guess I will just, I'll pick up where you left off on the enjoyment of our genes and knowing or not knowing what they do. Well, if we don't know what they do, it is my understanding that the patent office guy, you can't just patent a sequence standing alone. I discovered a sequence. Well, what does it do? I don't know, but it's really cool, right? That doesn't get you very far. You have to tell me what the gene codes for. 
So and I think Artie's point is that until you do know, and he goes through the first one to discover it, right? Humanity did not enjoy the advantage of advantage of it, now, as opposed to enjoying the you know the renal function of the kidneys. But um, and I think this may be the point where Josh and I, with small point, we may actually agree, is that I agree that you know in, in, whoever invents or discovers the, is a load bearing term. But the reason I think kidney is not patentable is because you didn't invent it. Whereas DNA seq was standing alone. Whether you want to call it, you snipped it or you figure out where the ends are, but that was an invention. That sequence does not exist in and of itself in the body. It exists as part of the chromosome. And so with that, and I agree, and I understand that the court doesn't want to say that, look, kidneys are patent eligible, but whether it's 20 years or 50 years or 70 years from now, I'm willing sort of to wager that we will have uh, synthetically grown kidneys in the lab. Should those not be patented? I mean, it, it seems to, it bothers me tremendously that a dialysis machine is, would be patent eligible, but a synthetically grown kidney would not be. But this, and I think so. Uh, Greg Castanius is making this point today, and so it's actually the point that I've made in my brief as well that medicine is moving away from chemical medicine to biologic medicine. We like that. We actually like to approximate what is happening in nature as much as possible because that. At least the idea is right that we'll have less side effects than a chemical that we're given to our bodies, right? Treating cancer, sure, but also causing hair to fall out, suppressing appetite, and so on. It seems bizarre to me that sort of new and improved methods of treat treating diseases through biologics would receive less patent protection than worse and older methods of treating it through chemicals. That you know, that just to borrow Chris's phrase, that just can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just again respond in two ways. The first one is that the court was attentive to this issue. It was actually, I think, their most sophisticated part where they asked, I think, it was then that asked, um, about the fact you can get a patent only on the use, and it's limited to particularly disclosed uses in Europe, and at least in some jurisdictions. So, again, the problem, this goes back to the over claiming and the, the um, whether or not these things actually incentivize more research or impede more research is you could be the first person to identify a single use and a very limited use, but you get to own the thing and that prevents, if you don't license, anyone from discovering any other use any from, because we have not much of an experimental use doctrine right now. And I know this is an argument that people say, you know, if that's a problem, change the experimental use doctrine. The second thing, though, is it just goes back to this question of, you know, what is it that we're trying to get these uses for? And my sense is that court really just doesn't have a feel yet for how it's going to draw the line about what kinds of uses should be patent eligible and what shouldn't. And once again, this is where we tried to give the court the answer in the brief, if the use is not analogous to the discovery itself, that should be a patentable invention. If it is analogous, because all you're doing is making use of what you discovered as the properties in nature, that should not be patentable. But okay, but then, Josh, going back to my uh, artificial kidney example, the whole point of right, artificial kidney is you have a renal, renal failure, you would have a kidney that would have the same function in the body, right? It would look, maybe it would not look, you have the same kidney being shaped, but same general idea, right? It will have all the tubules and it will, it will filter sodium and chloride and, and act just like a real kidney, right? It will have the same sort of meaty type appearance. Having the same function, would that be patent eligible or not? Because if it's not, then again, it seems that companies will continue to invest in expensive and ultimately problematic, re, uh, you know, uh, the dialysis machines rather than in artificial kidneys or, you know, synthetically grown kidneys. And isn't that like ultimately a bad deal for the public at large? Again, everything is fact specific as to what is sufficiently similar and sufficiently different. You're positing a synthetically grown thing, not something that's simply, again, removed from and used in a different way based on the discovery. Whether that would be considered sufficiently similar is a really good question. And if it is considered sufficiently different in structure and function, then I think, yes, it should be eligible. But that's 
precisely the question. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very Thank much. You. So what I think we'd like to do now is see if we get a couple of questions from the audience before we have to uh, wrap it up. We've got uh, actually uh, Bob Deegan. Do, please go ahead. So I was, I was curious because unless I've completely misread it, my guess is the lot of land's going to be pretty close to where the Solicitor General was. Um, and if that's the case, you said that they've got some serious factual errors and errors of law in there. Could you tell us what those are? Because we're going to have to live with those. The errors of law I, I most disagreed with was their interpretation of the case law that they cited to, to, uh, for their position. Um, but uh, I, I mean, one of the, the factual errors, I don't know if I. Uh, is, is you read their entire brief and uh, you think that pe it's almost as if the scientists are going in and snipping and pulling out the uh, the, the gene with a uh, as a little whole piece, and the way that these artificial um, these isolated DNA molecules are made is completely different. So. Um, you know, so basically, the, there's a real question as, uh, as to whether they're products of nature. They're really different. They're made by a very complicated process. Basically, you study the genes and, and you figure out how what their structure is from using a lot of little fragments and computers, and then you go to the, uh, the lab and with various techniques, you artificially make uh, the the gene in, in question. So what you've got is is so different from that, and I'm I'm sort of worried about the simplification. It's it's not just taking out a kidney. It's it's very very different. Um, and as I said, I, I they seem to just minimize that uh, there won't be any really serious effects of changing the law, but in fact uh, there there will be. In, in terms, particularly a lot of so much of the briefing, not just the government's, uh, focuses on well, it there's plenty of stimulus, there's plenty of incentive to discover things by university scientists who want grant support and the Nobel Prize. Uh, but the the real problem, what, what you really need the patents for, is for. Uh, getting investment in the extremely complicated and ex much more expensive business of developing the product, taking it to market, getting it uh, passing regulation and so on. And that's where, uh, you know, that's where I think some of the uh, incentives will be lost. We have a question of Joseph. Great. So um, I I'm a professor here. In the interest of full disclosure, I am a proud alum of the University of Utah. And I worked a summer at Myriad cleaning test tubes when I was an undergrad. So um, I, do have, I don't have any financial stake in the case, but I do have an interest in it. Um, so my question is, uh, I think the reason this case is really interesting is, is the economics. The, the Supreme Court's grappling with the economics of patent law. And they're struggling with the idea of static versus dynamic effects, and we've sort of touched on that. Um, so as, as someone who's a, a dry scientist rather than you know, a wet scientist, I, hopefully you can describe for me what are the negative dynamic effects of knocking out the G-DNA patents, right? So if we knock those out, and the court says, those are patent ineligible, right? My understanding is you can't get those nowadays because they're obvious or, or for various other reasons. So if we're not having any dynamic effects in that field, other than some general doubt about patent law in general, what are the negative dynamic effects of a narrow decision like that? Well, I think it will very much depend on how they write their opinion, right? I mean, if they simply say, Taking a smaller thing from a big, or anything that looks like taking a smaller thing from a bigger thing is necessarily patent ineligible. There's going to be problems, right? But if you narrow it, and I mean, if they write an opinion essentially kind of as Ari suggested, you know, you know take it for good for one bite only, then probably not that much because Myriad's patents are expiring what, within a year or two or something like that, right? So Myriad, sure, they're going to lose some money, but not a lot, and you know, and the war will go on, and but. I have little confidence in the Supreme Court ability to write something non-murky. 
So I thought it was interesting that the, even the bio brief didn't spend much time talking about why knocking out gDNA patents would be a problem. It really spent all its time talking about why we can't knock out therapeutic protein patents. I mean, that was the, the sum and substance of the brief. And, you know, that's what everyone's concerned about, I think. Well, I'll just add that, again, even a narrow decision that doesn't have a link between, a clear link between why they're singling out gDNA and cDNA or other stuff creates tremendous uncertainty that will have lots of costs in the patent system to figure it out. Thank you. Um, I'm Kevin McNeely. I'm a practicing patent attorney. And uh, I just wanted to say with regard to the, I'm not sure what the ability to grow an artificial kidney has to do with this case, but I just want to let you know I'd be happy to take that case on a contingency. If you come up with that, I'd love to. Um, but um, in terms of the case and the, the current sort of standard of testing, my understanding is that they are now sequencing the entire gene without having to perform this isolation step. So, and they're doing it less expensively than what Myriad Genetics charges just for the breast cancer screening. Um, and I think on March 22nd, the American College of Medical Genetics issued a, a set of policy or ethical guidelines and they wanted to sort out what are they going to do with all of these incidental findings, inclu including the result of breast cancer screening. Um, and they've issued these guidelines and they said that if you're in possession of, these, of this information as a clinician and as part of that information you have breast cancer screening information, you need to turn that over to the patient. Um, so it, it sort of puts them directly in opposition to Myriad's protection of its breast cancer screening. And I'm just curious what you think the result is going to be if Myriad ends up with a strong set of enforceable rights. Um, can Myriad prevent patients from getting this type of information? Or do you think that we've now moved beyond this state of technology where the debate you're having right now may not even be sort of relevant with respect to where testing is currently. Can I just say one sentence? Uh, whole genome sequencing does not allow you to sequence the entire genome. You still have to fragment the gene. Whole genome sequencing is infringing of myriad patents. Thank you. That was easy. <laughs> So, yeah, that's maybe the million dollar, trillion dollar, billion dollar question in this case. You know, what does isolated mean such that do Myriad's patents impede whole genome sequencing? And I think that's why, um, in my view, the, the government drew a distinction between gDNA and cDNA. The other thing is, had uh, the ACLU not been successful in challenging the method of comparison claims, then even if the whole genome sequencing was permissible, you still couldn't compare the information without violating the patents. So um, there would have been a much worse problem uh, than there already is. But i got to say, I mean, you know, it speak, you know, it, there's a certain signal, you know, there's a certain reason why it's ACLU and Association for Medical Pathology that's the plaintiff, and not Myriad. That's the plaintiff. So you're not a plaintiff. Sorry, I should use the counsel. Fair enough. Yeah, my, 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 my mistake. It's, there's a reason still why it's AMP and other clients that are plaintiffs, and not Myriad. That's plaintiff suing somebody for infringement. So if, if Myriad prevails, their next lawsuit is going to be against the American College of Medical. Uh, well, what, again, so I, I just want to point. I just want to point out Myriad was brought into this case. Myriad did not sue AMP or American College of Medical Genetics or anybody, I don't want to say anybody else, but it sued. Under the recent Nike decision, all they would have had to do is issue a covenant not to sue the particular plaintiffs, and this case would have been mooted. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as we all know, there are many people in the biotech industry who have wondered why Myriad didn't make this case go away. And for whatever reason, they didn't. Um, apparently, they have other claims that they allege they can assert against the uh, declaratory judgment 
plaintiffs in this case. Um, so there are lots of ways they could have made the peace go away, and they didn't. And um, I think it's fair to say that there are many fellow biotech companies that are a little bit perturbed. <laughs> But actually relevant to what you're discussing, I mean, there are newspaper reports that Myriad's main, most useful intellectual property assets are now its great database that it keeps secret as a trade secret. And, I mean, there is a problem that if you really get rid of these patents, there'll probably be more and more use of trade secrets. It won't miss it. Poppycock. I mean, that's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. The whole reason Myriad isn't able to keep that a trade secret is because they're the only ones allowed to do testing. If every lab in the country is doing the testing, the information will become widely available. It will have exactly the opposite reaction that you're talking about. I mean, I can't even... uh, It it, 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 uh, well, uh, and then uh, for, uh, for some reason, Myriad stock did uh, did tick upward after the argument Is for that right? that's right oh, interesting. for interesting reasons. Um, so in any case, well, I think that's really all the time we have. I, we we are a little bit over time. So please uh, join me in thanking our, our great uh, panel for a lively and informative discussion. We, we will have a reception outside that everybody is invited to, and you can keep asking questions or just uh, drown your sorrows, whichever you prefer. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.